uh, more specific impulse was to convene kind of a mix of both um, writers who are current students or recent graduates of some of the country's leading graduate training programs in playwriting, along with playwrights who teach and spend uh, part of their professional lives mentoring other writers, and in some cases were once students themselves. Um, so we're wondering just kind of what conversation might begin if this question was posed about what um, having that training or doing that work uh, means in one's creative and professional life. Um, and we were thrilled that Deborah Stein agreed um, to be our backup moderator for this discussion. Um, originally, uh, it was Adam Rapp, and he may be on his way and may be joining us. Um, but um, uh, Deborah has, has valiantly agreed to, um, to step in, so thanks. And I just have a couple of qu quick announcements about technology. Um, before we go any further. This morning's conversation is being live streamed by New Play TV, uh, which is a peer produced knowledge commons stewarded by HowlRound, a center for the theater commons. Um, so, welcome to those who may be watching this from around the country uh, or streaming it later on. And if anybody in the audience would like to participate via twi Twitter, you can use the hashtag New Play. Or if you uh, want to follow the ongoing conversation surrounding the festival, um, you can check us out on Twitter, Twitter at AT Louisville and look for the hashtag Humanifest. Um, also, when we reach the moment that the conversation opens up to the audience uh, gathered here, if you have a question or comment, I'm supposed to tell you to please use the microphones um, so that everybody in the room can hear you as well as online. Um, so uh, enough of logistics. Um, I want to just uh, take a moment to introduce Deborah uh, and get things started. Um, everybody at Actors is delighted to have her back in the house. Um, she is a veteran of several recent Humana festivals with the projects Heist, Fissures Lost and Found, and Brink. And in addition to having plays produced all over the country and internationally, um, and a long history with ensemble-based collaborative work, uh, Deborah is with Suli Holum, the co-artistic director of Stein Holum Projects, which is a laboratory for creating new work. And um, so Deborah, it's all yours, and um, thank you so much to you all for, for doing this. <laughs> Um, hi. Um, so thank you to actors for having us here, and um, I'm so excited to participate in this panel, or to moderate this panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for so many reasons, both um, I think of Actors Theatre of Louisville as an artistic home, and, um, and also uh, to be on sharing the stage with these really wonderful artists and teachers. So I wanted to let everyone introduce themselves, and then, um, and then I have a couple of questions. Hi, I'm Paula Vogel. <laughs> and I, I feel like we should we should have our lineage too. I'm Paula Vogel's student, Sarah Rule. I'm Mallory Avedon, and I went to Cornish College of the Arts for undergrad. And Mame Hunt it was one of my teachers, and she's in the audience here. And then I went to Brown for graduate school. But Paula was not my teacher there. <laughs> um, I'm Jeff uh, uh, Augustine. I am um, <laughs> currently a second year MFA playwriting student at UC San Diego. And actually, my undergrad playwright professor is here as well, Scott Cummings from Boston College. <laughs> Uh, my lineage is that I'm also a student of Paula from Brown. <laughs> so I want to say, yeah, so I'm it's really, really special to be up here doing this. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start by throwing a question to all four of you and, um, that we could and, and hopefully start a conversation from this one question, which was um, overnight I was thinking about teaching playwriting as both the teaching of writing and also the teaching of theater, and then teaching theater I was thinking breaks down into both teaching um, aspects of theatrical creation, collaboration, as well as uh, thinking about the visual and um, non-language non based aspects of theater. Uh, and then also the, the business side of theater, that the, um, the, the skills uh, to collaborate is also business skill, and, um, and then also the, the kinds of networks that we um, get when we study theater, the, the artists and future leaders of theaters that then we uh, 
both grow up with and grow into the theater with, and the, the people that we might meet who are mentors who then become collaborators. And um, so just th thinking about that frame, I'm curious, uh, for those of you who teach, how you, how, how you think of um, te teaching playwriting in this way, how it breaks down for you, and for those of you who um, are studying it, how being in school has changed or altered or affected the way you think of playwriting as a practice in the world. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you know, it's, as you were saying that, I was thinking how wonderful to be at Actors Theatre of Louisville, um, at, that my teaching practice is in many ways informed by being 27 years old and uh, receiving some encouragement on a one act and then being given notes on the oldest profession that it was horrifying and disgusting that I would think of my uh, grandmother and aunts as prostitutes. <laughs> and I did not have a mentor who would say, don't write that letter to John Jory. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote the letter to John Jory and I sent it, and that's why this is my third time at Actors Theatre of Louisville doing panels. <laughs> um, but in it, but right, in essence, I mean, I think in a way we, we are constantly stumbling um, with uh, a kind of, it's a delicate dance with our collaborators. Um, we are in the business of writing our heart and our soul, but then to draw back and be protective of our collaborators and not injure them because we are not recyclable as artists. Um, and I think everybody in this room uh, is bearing the scars. So it's a delicate dance to, to sort of, I think I've said this to every artist, you know, there's, I'm gonna say some really awful things. If you come and give me the honor of working with me for three years, I can only guarantee that at some point at midnight, we're going to be either having coffee or vodka over a table, <laughs> holding each other's hands and weeping. <laughs> with me saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> You have to forgive me, um, which kind of takes its toll. On the, on the other hand, it's also recognizing that right when we are in an institution, that institution is necessarily 10 years behind whatever the theater is on that page, because that page is creating a new theater, and the institution is 10 years behind, trying and striving to catch up. Um, so I don't actually think of it as teaching. I mean, I think of it as trying not to do it harm. I think of it as trying to give artists as many introductions to the apparatus as possible so that they can figure out strategy and how to use that apparatus. And whether it's, you know, University of California, San Diego, or Brown, um, or Yale, or Austin, or Iowa, that's the same strategy. You're, you're basically forming a kind of persona, right, as an, as an artist activist that will then translate to Louisville to a 90-seat theater, right? So that's, that's basically it for me. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm just so honored to be on this panel with these writers and with Paula, um, who was my teacher uh, from the time I was what, 20, we met when I was 20. Um, it's about 20 years ago, 19. Um, and I'm very humbled to sit with Paula because she's really a consummate, consummate teacher. And I, I just started teaching, so it's humbling for me to think, how can I be a teacher? Um, and I have three small children, um, and two of them are preschool age, and. I picked up a book on the teachings of Maria Montessori recently. Do you guys know her? Kind of an amazing educator uh, who transformed early childhood education. And she was really interested in the concept of the teacherless classroom, where the kids just kind of went and quietly worked with strange little manipulatives and insets. And 
So um, in my teaching right now, I've been thinking about how can I have a teacherless classroom? Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I guess what interests me in the theater, what is a teacherless classroom in the theater? What are the manipulatives in the theater? And I thought, well, it's actors. Um, and not that actors, <laughs> you know, but they are the they are the um, the instrument. So this semester uh, at Yale, I've been working with graduate students, and we've had actors in who who read the plays, and then the writer runs the room and and runs the discussion with the actors. So I guess I've been interested in lately how can we um, how can we teach writers at the graduate level to be empowered to run a room so that when they graduate and, and will have years of sort of patience and development where they're, they get a lot of feedback, how can graduate school actually be a training ground wherein they can, like a whale, um, sieve out the feedback? I mean, don't whales digest things in a very interesting way where they have this <laughs> <laughs> So how can they take in what they need um, and, and disregard the West? So it's a strange position to be in as a teacher to say, I'm going to teach you to disregard me. That's right. Um, yeah. So how do you maintain some semblance of dignity and say, I'm going to teach you how to disregard me? So that's what I've been working on lately. I mean, I'm still new to this. Um, you know, Paul's been doing it her whole life, really. Um, so I've been a lot of people's student, and though I just said I wasn't Paula's student, I feel like I still was because her imprint on Brown is very deep, and Sam Marks, who is here, was still on campus when I was there, and he was a student of Paula's, and Sam and Dan LaFranc and Greg Moss sort of gave us a crash course in Paula's boot camp when we were there to continue the lineage. And also, I have, I, for me, finding mentorship anywhere that you can is so important and so I just was saying to Sarah, I remember the first time I met Sarah she brought me iced tea, a ladder had fallen on my head, it was very sweet of her. <laughs> and then when I was in graduate school, Lisa Damore, who was one of my professors, set up a meeting for us with Sarah and Melissa James Gibson and I remember some of the things you said about teaching them, specifically that you have to teach your students how to write their own plays, not how to write your plays, which I think is sort of what you're saying now. Um, and also, from when I visited Yale with you, I remember you saying, I was going to do a reading at a theater, and you were like, your job is to make best friends with everyone at the theater for however long you're there. And, and I, think that's a, I think that's really important, like, be nice, be kind, it's so important, but these like little lessons you can find anywhere. And then grad school for me was time to write. That I had been in New York for three years and I had one play that a bunch of theaters had read and they were like, we like that play, we're not gonna produce it. Give us another play. And I was like, but I don't have another play because I work 80 hours a week. And so then I got to go to Brown for two years and write. And when I was first there, I was freaking out and Dan LaFranc was like, you're an artist in residence here for two years, which I just learned is something Paula had told him. And so the, the lineage continues, and then, you know, Les is a mentor of mine, and Mame is here. Mame has never been to Humana before. She's one of the dramaturgs at Sundance, and she's here because she's, she knows me and Jeff and Brandon. And the, the importance of that community and that mentorship, I, I feel so supported by so many people, and I couldn't do this without that. But you also, I feel like you have to learn how to learn for yourself. You can't just find it in an educational institution. Like, I, I feel like I've learned so much, the business stuff you were talking about, that we had this long press day, the, my first day off, and I sat next to Will Eno, and I feel like, oh, now I know how to do this because I just learned from someone who was sitting next to me. But I could never have learned that in school. Like, I can't, you can't learn how to give a press conference by talking about giving a press conference. And like, okay, I just did that. I guess I know how to do that now. Um, that's what I have to say. Hello. Here. Yes. Uh, great. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's, I, I, something that I, I went to grad school also because I was working like 
10 hour days and trying to uh, and trying to write and I think grad school has become this kind of this place that I've kind of learned this discipline of writing and also I think there's something to this idea um, and Naomi Izuka had uh, the writing uh, program at UC San Diego and I think she very much has that idea of um, coming in and, and teaching but not not putting her voice onto you um, in, a, in a lovely way and I was recently freaking out um, as I'm thinking about how do I write, because I also like, I also go to Naomi at like midnight and I'm like crying and being like, what am I doing with my life? How do I write this? Um, and she's, and, and so I've been freaking out lately, how do, how do I do that? How am I going to do that when I graduate? Um, and I think there is, there's something uh, wonderful and, and, and she's recently kind of been letting go and kind of just letting me go and play. Um, I think this experience has been wonderful. Um, I think. I think really like this mentorship. I mean, I, Les uh, taught a, class, a course to us, and I learned a great deal uh, from that. And also, just kind of, uh, I think grad school has also opened up this kind of collaborative kind of nature of what theater is. Because I think I, you, you start off and you put your so much heart into it, and it's learning that oh yes, and doing that feedback and learning. I think a lot from working with actors and working with our directors and our designers and kind of how does how does this all work together. Um, and you actually have two more layers in terms of this question of the teaching of playwriting, but also how does one then teach theater making, which is you started in an ensemble collective and went through uh, the graduate program, participated in a theater company in Minneapolis, and you're now producing as well as teaching at NYU and Yale. So, in terms of that is a remarkable journey. Um, do you find that role of being an artistic director or producer um, either stabilizing or destabilizing what your praxis has been as a writer, as a teacher? Um, wow. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that um, I think I'm I'm able to think of it all as aspects of one large practice, and I think that I'm largely able to do that because of studying with you and, and because of your approach to, to teaching as an extension of a creative activity. And um, that when you talk about the, the plays that we are all writing as being the plays of 10 years from now, that there is something of the investigative process of writing and, and an interrogative process that part of being a creative person is um, Make, putting something out in the world that was never there before and questioning what is there. And I think that that's what, um, as Sarah was saying, that, that's, that, that, that a teacher creates a space in which uh, individual artists can go, I, I experience that for themselves. And I think that um, the, in, in terms of the, the specific things that I've been doing lately, I think I'm calling myself a producer because I'm taking the reins of the production of my own work in a way that, um, is usually called producing, but it's because I found those to be aspects of my creative process that if I didn't call myself a producer, I wouldn't be allowed or enabled to, to do. But there, there's many aspects of producing that I'm terrible at. And, and look forward to the day that I can raise money and, and hire people to work for my company to do those things. But in the meantime, <laughs> but in the, mean, in the meantime, um, there, there are aspects of producing the, the collab, specifically collaborating with, um, with, with designers, with, um, with marketing, with writing press releases, with, which, which, is, which is about a relationship with an audience, which to me has always been part of, of making theater, that, that make, you make theater with an audience in mind so that the, my, the, the idea of being cut out of crafting that relationship was always very confusing to me. Um, uh, and, and so when I'm teaching, I, I try to create a space where, not, not where art, artists are becoming clones of me, but where they can figure out what is it, what, is, what does the theater look like that they want to make, which is something um, that, that Ann Bogart and Joseph Chicken talk about, right? What, what, that, that the theater is a utopian space where you get to create the world you want to live in. So that um, what I hope in teaching is that I can create a space for students to consider that question, so that when they leave and, and, be, and and work professionally, they are, they are armed in the ways that all of you articulated to, to, to make that happen in the world. Um, 
which is a segue to the next question I wanted to throw at you guys, which is about how um, teaching or uh, studying in a formal way affected your own writing and what your, what your journeys were through that, through that process. Yeah, let's start with Jeff. Um, okay. um, I think it's uh, it, great. I, I went to, uh, partly I went to grad school because I think, uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, mainly I, an undergrad, um, my professor very much opened, we played a lot with kind of imagination, we played a lot with kind of figuring out um, what, why, why, this, why do you want to tell the story, what is this play about? Um, and I think both, the, both kind of figuring out um, what I'm trying to write, kind of like the kind of larger questions, um, and also grads, uh, is what I kind of learned in my undergrad, and I think my grad, grad school right now is I'm playing with that and the ideas, and I think grad school is, um, changed very early, like Naomi has this kind of, we come in with new play ideas, um, and even the way I think now about um, my approach to coming up with a play idea has changed largely. Um, I think grad school has affected that. I think grad school has also affected kind of just like uh, the, the kind of theater I thought that I wanted to create, um, and it's in a, in a wonderful way. I thought it was going to be like this, this kind of very, uh, uh, kind of, you know, kind of very experimental kind of uh, artist, and I think um, Naomi's opened up something and that has allowed me to kind of be okay with it and play with different kind of structures okay. in a wonderful way. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah. Um, I also taught when I was at Brown, and I, and I taught a little bit at Cornish, and one of my students is actually here from Cornish, which is another lovely thing. And I feel like one of the things that I learned at Brown was about my writing through teaching, and that's something that Paula instituted at the university that I think is so important to have to teach when you have no idea what you're doing on some level. Because then you have to articulate what you're doing to young people. It's like, oh, I better figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> Which is difficult, but also amazing. Um, and I feel like you just use the word artist activist, and I think that actually at Brown I learned as much about sort of how to be a person in the theater and the world as I did about actually writing. Like, I had written a lot for a long time and I feel like my voice, if you will, was pretty like set. And then I had time to write at Brown. And also Eric N, took, so my professors primarily were Lisa Damore and Eric N and both of them have, incred they're incredible people who live in the world in a very specific way um, that I admire a great deal and they are actually creating their utopias in a way, like really doing that in a way that makes it seem possible to like make the work you want and have a life that is something that you want to have. And a lot of the time the theater doesn't feel like that. So it's like, oh, okay, there is a way to like do good in the world and make your art that you want to make and that's what I felt like I learned in school. Um. <laughs> uh, there's so much to say about this. I mean, I think that um, there's the content of what I learned at Brown, and then there's the thing about the example, the example of the person, the person who, that Paula was. Um, and I, I, I think Paula has this <laughs> you know, incredibly galvanizing effect on people. And when I met Paula, I wrote poetry a little bit, and um, and Paula sort of brought me uh, in, out of out of poetry into writing three dimensionally, and um, taught me about what that architecture might look like. And I'll never forget being in a in a class with you, Paula, when you read out loud the stage directions from Tennessee Williams. Um, glass, it was Glass Menagerie, right? No, it was no, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. So Paula read out, I said, I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee Williams' love letter to the reader. 
And so it was from Paula that I learned that stage directions didn't have to be schematic blueprints, that they were actually literary in texture and readerly. Um, and so that I, I think that's what allowed me to move from writing poetry to writing plays, because I learned that there was this sort of third space um, in the architecture of plays beyond the dialogue, and that there was room to, um, to sort of maneuver um, with the language. And um, I also think it's interesting that everyone's talking about this, this sort of almost <coughs> medical uh, model of teaching, with the medical model is um, learn when, do when, teach when. And so when you're a doctor, it's assumed that you'll teach one in order, like you'll teach how to do a liver surgery so that you know how to better do it yourself and so that it continues. And um, so I think there's there's that there's that thing of, of, of learning, learning the content, doing it, trying it, and then and then passing it on as a way of knowing it. Um, first and foremost, I mean, I, you know, I still. Um, on a daily basis, um, talk back to my teacher, um, who died um, my first preview uh, of Long Christmas Ride Home, which was another conversation back with him. And one of my best friends who was in grad school with me was waiting for me backstage to tell me um, that Bert States was dead and wanted me to know. Um, so. Uh, it's a, a, an enormous reach uh, in terms of the, the, this discussion, and you know, every boot camp I do, every um, workshop, I am still um, kind of asking questions that he asked me, uh, and and trying to come back at it uh, a, a different way. And if I ever get the time, I do want to write that playwriting book where I. <laughs> talk more to Bert. It's a conversation with Bert. But the other thing about, you know, the notion of the teaching, first of all, I think it's a mistake to ever admit students. Um, I think one should admit artists who are going to teach you something that you don't know how to do. Um, and so there's a lot of times when I'm reading and I'm thinking, you're approaching this as a student rather than as an original voice that is very urgent on the page. Um, and quite selfishly and just baldly, I want to say that the only reason to teach is to learn how to do something I don't know how to do, right? That we don't know how to do. And that by having the collision of these voices, um, every day you're going, we're going to examine our own basic assumptions. Uh, and, and particularly be proven wrong. I think it's the most thrilling thing in a workshop. The other thing I want to say, I still have this, you know, I grew up um, below the poverty level. So the notion that I grew up at a time where I was given a scholarship, or I could work three jobs to finish my college degree, or that, you know, I called this guy out of the blue because Yale School of Drama turned me down and I didn't know how to become a playwright. So I thought, well, maybe I'd like to teach, and called this guy at Cornell and said, I know it's too late, Will you accept applications? And the guy who answered the phone was Bert States. And he said, well, you're late in the application. I could give you tuition. He, he read my application. I got it to him. And he said, can you pay your rent and your daily bread? And I'm like, I type 85 words per minute, sure. And showed up at his doorstep. The whole notion that a <coughs> university should have a place and centers for artists to be a serious place of scholarship is paramount. And one of the things that's been upsetting to me in the past 20, 30 years is that whenever I do go onto blogs and I try not to, I hear all of this Emmett Fays, Brown, Yale, Iowa, you know, Austin, UCSD, as if playwrights are coming from extremely well-to-do, upper-class white families. That's not true. And first of all, we shouldn't even be asking what you're making because these programs should be free. And when people say, when should I go to graduate school, I'm saying, you know it's the right time when you get a free ride 
<laughs> when you get a free ride, universities should be paying for the exciting opportunity this presents to their students to have you as the emerging thinkers of theater. And you are there as a resource for the faculty, you know. And I, so I'm always amazed at the kind of rift between a lot of people and what they think an MFA is versus what it is, which is an artist in residency, which is um, something that will teach the faculty. People, artists who will teach the faculty, who will inform the 18-year-olds in terms of what is possible is the real purpose for the MFA to give the rent and food for three years so that people like you can write, like you can write, right? Eight plays or have the eight raw scripts, you know, in on your computer desktop by the time you leave, rather than having to painfully put that together in 10 or 15 years. Um, and it is the opera that that is the responsibility of education in this country to give that space. I'm still working on plays that were raw scripts that I wrote. I graduated Brown nine years ago. And so, um, so yes, exactly. Um, I wanted to open up to questions to see if there was anyone. Um, there are microphones. Should we hand out our microphones? Great. So yeah. So if you want to raise a question, ask a question, raise your hand, and someone will get a mic to you. Actually, I have a burden question. Actually, um, my name is Susan Russell. I teach at Small Liberal Arts College, uh, literature and history, and also playwriting. And I have a wonderful student <clears throat> who just finished her PhD in England and wrote a book about device theater. Her name is Sarah Siegel. She's a wonderful playwright, too. And um, so I got this grant because I thought it was a great idea to try to include some devising in my playwriting class. And so somebody was convinced that that was a good idea because they're giving me a little bit of money. But now that I got that grant, <laughs> I'm facing this summer and I'm wondering whether this is a crazy idea or if it really seems to be something that is possible and what you think about adding a devising component in a, in a beginning playwriting class. I think it's terrific. <laughs> Which is, is partially my bias because I, I do device work, but um, so help me, please. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'd actually be ha happy to talk uh, more at, at greater length. But I, um, I'm, I'm curious. One of the questions I had that I didn't get to ask was about the kinds of collaboration that you guys found useful. So I don't want to hog this answer, but um, I do think that um, the that artists in the gener in in the current generation and, and artists who are just coming up now are um, collaborating in ways that are uh, different and new, and I think part of that is in the culture that we, we live in a time of, of crowdsourcing and horizontalism. So there is this aspect, the, the bureaucratic hierarchical aspect of, uh, of creative process that used to be taken as a given are no longer taken as such. So that um, all kinds of artists that I know, playwrights and directors and designers, are choosing to collaborate in new ways and to look at a piece they want to make and think about what is the right process to do this. And I think that teaching devised work to undergrads is a way to arm artists with just a greater toolbox of ways to go out and make the work they want to make. Again, I'm not going to turn all of my students into devised makers, but I want them to know that that opportunity is out there, especially because it is a way for you to take the, um, to, 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 uh, to, to be a leader in your own process in a way that uh, some conventional processes don't allow you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a ton of great companies uh, throughout the country and Europe who are, are making devised work who uh, had been in tiny, tiny little fringe theaters and are now are starting to be embraced <coughs> by the larger institutional theaters. So I also think it's just a good investment to make. Did anyone want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> um, I lived in New York before grad school and worked in the downtown theater. And uh, to me, device work is an old thing, not a new thing. It's just a new name. Like Shakespeare had a company. He wrote for actors. Joint stock. I'm obsessed. Carol Churchill wrote amazing plays. They're 
theater is collaborative, and I think sometimes what happens when you teach devised work is it's taking people out of the process. That's why Pig Iron to me is so awesome, because it's like, it is a devised collaborative process, but there's still designers, directors, actors, and playwrights all working together. I think that collaboration is so important. Being able to collaborate through an entire process is amazing, but do we really have to call it something else? <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Michelle Volansky, and I am a uh, dramaturg uh, in life, and I also am an academic at a small liberal arts college, as well as running a new play conference in Philadelphia. Um, I teach primarily undergraduates, and I'm under not a whole lot of delusion that I'm training the next great generation of actors, directors, designers, but I do believe that I'm, I'm raising citizens. And I wonder if, if you guys might muse a little bit about how to infuse the teaching of theater into um, creating emerging leaders, as Paula said, um, or not just for the theater, but for the world. Hi, Michelle. Uh, hey, Michelle. I, you know, first of all, there might be. Of course there is. There will be. I mean, if they've got you as a teacher, there will be. And, um, but it's the same thing that I think we all think every time we're in the classroom, that what we really want to do is we want to make sure that what, how thrilling to possibly fertilize the ground for someone to become a board member of a not-for-profit theater. That's thrilling. Um, to uh, develop uh, the urgency of taking their children to theater, to find an advocate who goes to the school board and says, we need an after school program. This is an enormous investment of time and their future, and I think it's incredibly important. Um, here's where I always feel the rub is for me in terms of the undergraduate, uh, I think, uh, teaching, is one wants to put undergraduates, expose them to praxis actually get them not, not only to be in love with the reading of plays, but to smell the stage dust that we're inhaling right now, um, that you recognize the second you enter backstage, you can smell that stage dust, and it feels like heaven. How do we get that into the bloodstream? <laughs> that can be very difficult depending on where you're located. Um, and that becomes really where the political rub happens for us as faculty members because you have to convince a university which is a business and wants to operate in a mode of efficiency to literally construct a theater, which then means you're basically doing fundraising, advocacy, and you're adding on about 10 times of a workload for every hour in the classroom. It's really true. I mean, I think those of us, all of us who teach theater, <coughs> we're looking at a 10-time investment outside of the classroom if there isn't already a structure there. If there's a repertory theater, it means trying to become the best friend of the literary manager, whoever's in, in charge of the intern program, all of that stuff. I don't, I mean, uh, this is preaching to the choir here, right? Um, but I really don't think we addict people until they're actually in the process. Well, and, and this doesn't really have to do it with your question so much, Michelle, but just in terms of Paula and thinking about how you teach. I mean, when I was 20, I wrote this play, Passion Play, that I wrote with Paula. Well, not with her, but across the table from her at a coffee shop, giving her 10 pages a week. And she said, oh, I'm going to do a stage reading of it. And I thought, oh, God, that's terrifying. Um, because at the time, I really wasn't, I wasn't involved in the theater. So she snuck it into a little reading festival. And then I finished the play. That's Alice Twan. She was in this festival, too. So, so anyway, so then Paula snuck it into the festival um, with the graduate student, which, which Alice was one. That's why it's sort of surreal, this audience. Um, so she snuck it into this festival at Trinity Rec, which was down the hill from Brown. And that was the moment. That was what addicted me. That was what addicted me. I, I, um, I drove there for opening night, got in a car accident on the way on Hope Street, 
<laughs> blacked out. You're talking about, oh, I didn't get a concussion the other day when I met you. Anyway, speaking of concussions, I didn't go to the hospital. Instead, I went to see my play. <laughs> dimensions where I sort of thought, oh, I can't go back. And I did go to the hospital the next day. And I <laughs> anyway. Next question. Hi. Um, I'm a, a, in an MFA program right now for acting. And my question is about sort of the theater making collaborative aspect that we're talking about. This is my first time at the Humana Festival. And one of the reasons that I wanted to come so badly is because I'm interested in working on new work. And um, what I wonder is, what is useful for an actor who wants to work on new work to bring to the process of you know, making, making theater out of it? I mean, besides bringing it to life, you know, what's useful? What, what can I do if I want to be part of making new work as, as, an, as an actor? Flexibility, non-attachment. <laughs> what do you mean by non-attachment? I, I think also um, thinking of yourself as a as a creative artist who brings something to the table rather than a technician or a vessel. That I've I've talked to actors who, who approach it in different ways, and I find that the that actors who think of themselves as are creative, generative artists bring the most to the process. Um, that, that if you, if I find that actors who think of themselves as, as vessels for a vision uh, are, are, are looking for something that's already there, but the process of working on a new play is making something that isn't there. And I think uh, investment and non-attachment is what I'm, so like being all the way there all of the time and then letting it all go when everything changes, because everything changes. <laughs> and feedback-wise, what's useful? At, you know, at, at stage readings or in development, what's useful? What do you want to hear from actors, if anything? I mean, I want to hear what their in where their instincts are. I don't want to hear literary advice from them, um, but I do want to hear how they're inside of it or not inside of it. Yeah, I think like what is yeah, what, what is that investment? What is the thing that like because. Because I, I can intellectually like figure out like you know sometimes beats and like what structurally what needs to happen, but it's also that like instinct of what what is moving that person at that that actor. What is what is that thing that you're holding on to um, that you're passionate about in the piece? I also think it's really helpful. Uh, I, I think we're all faced with those certain difficulties. Someone once told me when I was starting to write, think of writing movies and TV, and we all have this in our life cycle of a playwright in the American theater, <laughs> that I had to read Sid Fields. And I read it and just, and I actually took a TV uh, workshop, which was really fun, because it was taught by a, a guy who had been at Carnegie Mellon teaching theater. And he just, you know, was giving the terminology, but then he started talking about 19th century well-made play terms on an aside to me, and I went, got it. So someone said, look, if you know how to pitch it, you can pitch Rashomon as a Sid Field movie <laughs> with the plot points. And the reason I'm bringing this up is Stanislavski. Because one of the things that's happening, I think, in a lot of graduate <coughs> schools is that Stanislavski is still the mode. And I just have to say, the only thing that, that I sometimes do with artists who are creating this new language is saying, you know, it might be a good idea for us to take three weeks of the actor training so we hear what language it is and how do we translate Rashomon into Sid Field. But the other really best thing that I think that really helps me is that I don't have any words ever to describe a new play that lands you know, in my inbox. I just don't have the words. But I have the advantage of three years of going to coffee. And it's actually in the body language of the playwright. So I often think, like, I would understand Woody Allen completely. The tempo and everything else is if I had coffee and we talked about anything but the scripts. Good morning. Um, my name is Scott Cummings. I teach in the theater department at Boston College. Um, I wanted to pick up on the idea 
of creating uh, a space, a learning space, a creative space, a, a safe space. Uh, and ask you if you'd share with us any specific um, techniques or practices in that space. I, I'm, I'm thinking partly of another playwright who's well known uh, as a teacher, Irene Fornes, who um, began her um, teaching sessions with you know, what she called uh, yoga and uh, 15 or 20 minutes of stretching and breathing. And during her period of teaching at Intar, um, I think was well known for wanting to make sure that the individual wooden desks were all arranged in a way that the corners touched each other, even though students spent most of their time writing um, privately, as it were. Are there specific things that you would be willing to share with us that you do on a day-to-day -day basis to shape and mold that space? Well, nothing. I, um, I, I, I should. I studied with Irene uh, and did, did her yoga, and I would be so embarrassed to ask people to do yoga in my class or to try to teach them to do yoga, um, and I should get over it. <laughs> but undergrads, but not, I don't, yeah, it's just, it's so <laughs> Rachel, you were my student. Did I do anything? <laughs> um, I, I feel like uh, the only thing I will offer is something that Eric says about feedback, which is the only purpose of feedback is to create more writing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if everyone knows that going in, that in itself creates a safe space. If you like think that everyone is on your side and just wants your play to be itself instead of feeling like everyone is against you, which sometimes a playwriting workshop ends up feeling like everyone is against each other. Yeah, um, yeah so I think similar to what Mallory is talking about, I um, will start every semester, even if what people are working on are, are long, are, go are going to be longer pieces, I'll start with a couple of pieces of doing very, very short pieces or in class <coughs> that everybody shares and everybody reads. So everybody's in there, they tend to be pretty weird assignments so that everyone is taking a risk and is outside of their comfort zone um, and that that everyone shares that and, and because everyone knows what risk everyone else is taking, everyone loves it and, um, and it's really exciting. And then, um, and then it creates this, it, it, I find that that creates a world, a, a room where everyone is on each other's side and you know that. Mm -hmm. And you also, um, then know that everyone is, is, is capable of and planning to try something they've never done before, so it inspires you to do the same, I hope. I, you know, I, I'm addicted to this thing uh, called the Bake Off, um, because I think uh, it really breaks through the ice, and I think it's terrifying maybe the first time we do one, but um, it, it, we all write the same play, um, so everyone has to write the same play, and you have to do it in 48 hours. And um, so basically, I started creating these things where we would read one or two or three plays, <coughs> and then we would either jointly uh, design it, or I would just say, here it is. And uh, for example, um, I'm finally writing my Don Juan Bake Off after having assigned it um, for the last 20 years. Don Juan Bake Off, read Tirso de Molina, right, the stone guest. Read my one of my favorite plays, Don Juan Comes Home from the Wars. And then in 48 hours, you might must write a play with a ghost, a statue, sword play, a master, a servant, and a moment of coitus interruptus. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, the astonishing writers that so many of us love in this room have turned me upside down. And then we all come together. And there has to we have to bring in food. We have to bring in coffee or tea. It usually ends after 12 hours of reading with a stiff drink or two. But to hear 12 different Don Juans is so, it's like, it's a spiritual moment. And it completely melts, I think, the notion of Darwinian survival of the fittest, <laughs> of competition, of oh my God, each voice is unique. And the excitement at the, the collective toolkit is astonishing. That, um, I, we all do this stuff, right? 24 hours, here's, I used to put a, a theme on my door, like Hamlet, 
And it was open to anyone who wanted to do it. And I'd say, quick, you know, you've got uh, four days to respond, 10 pages, but you only get an hour of rehearsal. And then let's throw it up. What did we used to call that? Once upon a weekend, we called it. We kept um, it going. I don't know did if Did you keep it going? going? But we kept it going. Oh my God, this was really fun too. Um, uh, I think it was Honor Malloy, John Russell. I think this, you were doing this. We decided to do something in homage to John Jesserin, who used to do this thing in this bar, the Pyramid Club, called Chang and Avoid Moon, I think, where you'd go to the bar and he'd say, as you will recall in episode 57, every Monday night, they present this, a half an hour living, it, it was, it was a half an hour TV episode on crack cocaine. <laughs> and he would stand up and he would give a plot summary of all 57 plots in like, I don't know, a minute and a half. And now they go, and now episode 58. And the whole collective created the half hour TV <laughs> series. We did that in the cafeteria one year. Um, where everybody had to decide who was going to be editor for the plot, and they, they kept it up for 12. But I have to say, those half hours for 12 weeks was some of the happiest time I've experienced in, in life. So, I mean, I think I'm saying what everybody else is saying, right? It's like, what do we want to do? And at some point, basically, writers are going to go, hey, there's 12 of us, we found an abandoned house, we're taking all of our computers, we're going to write something collectively. And they came back with 200 pages that they then pared down to 120 astonishing pages. They actually literally wrote in a big circle with the computers. That was a brown. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joel Hennig. Uh, this is going to reveal my age. I want to play a bit of devil's advocate because you all kind of stand for the opposite. But my mentor and friend and teacher as an undergraduate was Robert Chapman, who wrote Billy Budd, and not very much else. And Bob always said, if you want to write, don't teach. <laughs> and while, as I say, you're all uh, living examples of the opposite, how, how, how would you respond to that? What was going on, at least, with Bob? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not teaching right now, um, and I hope to teach again in the future, but I want to be a good teacher, and I feel like I don't have the mental energy right now to be a good teacher and to do my own work, but I hope to be able to have more stability in the future and go back to it. And to me, that's what, like, if, if you are actually doing your writing, it's hard to be a good teacher, and so and, and vice versa. So to me, that's what that means. I think there's something to what your friend said. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, Paula would probably agree that you got more writing done when you were on leave from teaching. However, um, I mean, however, uh, <laughs> I, I think at a point, I think you know when you're ready uh, to, to give back to, to the community. And, um, and I think you also learn a lot from doing that. Very inarticulate. I mean, yes, you have more time to do your writing, you're not but not if you have a different kind of job. Right. True enough, right? So, so teaching is, is creative. I get to be steeped in theater and language all the time. I get summers off. I get a month in January. I get to be surrounded by artists who are showing me things I've never thought of before. Um, that didn't happen when I was a waitress. It didn't happen when I was an office temp. Um, uh, I have to pay the rent, and and I'd rather do it in a way that is really inspiring. That that inspires me to do my own work, um, and that um, the it, it, I don't know. There's like a in a. In the United States today, there is a financial reality of, of being an artist, which is that there's very there's there's no state support, so that support has to come from somewhere. Um, I, I would also say that yeah, I um, like Mallory's describing. I took a number of years off that I um, I knew when I was at Brown that I wanted to teach and that 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 I got to teach while I was at Brown, and then I didn't 
I did it for one year after school and I, I realized I was never gonna write again if I kept doing it. So I took six years off and I just started doing it again and it's because Paula brought me to Yale to teach a class on ensemble device playmaking with the playwrights in which I got to take the work I've been doing for 10 years and turn that into a pedagogy so that it was actually, that it, it, was, it was of a part with the work that I was doing. And that that was, that I think that made it possible for me to think of um, the teaching I was doing as, a, as an enriching experience because suddenly I had to, I got to pause from the constant making of plays and actually think about how I was doing what I was doing and that that has made me uh, better and hungrier to do more things. Um, you, once you go down that road, you might as well say, well, you shouldn't have a family, you shouldn't have children, you shouldn't take care of your aging parents. No, really, you start going down this road and what it does do is, look, I, I meet a lot of people that I just say, you know what, you have a playwright's personality and not a novelist personality, which is, you like to have a party. You like to be in a room with people. Why would you be a novelist for seven years in isolation, right? So, I mean, a lot of times writers would knock on my door and say, you know, Professor so-and-so told me to see you. And I'm like, oh, come in the office. <laughs> and 15 minutes later, I'm like, you know, you feel like a playwright to me. And not, this is not without, with, with, you know, not reading. I do think one of the things that happens with us, it's a balancing act. It's a juggling act. Um, if you assume that teaching is actually exposing yourself to completely different aesthetics so that you never write the same play twice, it's a good idea to teach. The real rub comes when, for example, you know, in Michelle's question, thinking, do I have to create an entire apparatus so that my, my young writers can breathe in stage dust? That's where I think the rub happens. I think it happens more with the notion of going to another faculty meeting versus the notion of being in another room of 10 different vibrating voices. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's that faculty meeting where you suddenly are in the time of a Beckett play. <laughs> I would agree, don't teach. <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Or we have time for one more question. Oh, Al. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Alice Twan. I head up the Writing for Performance program at CalArts. And uh, thanks, you guys. Um, so my question is about liveness and the internet generation. Because now we're training playwrights that have the internet mindscape. And I feel like the internet is kind of like the Gutenberg moment. You know, it's like it's forever changing human consciousness. And I actually am optimistic about theater because I think that, oh, the liveness is going to be important as, you know, everybody's kind of compartmentalized in their little electronic campfires. But th it is a different mindscape, you know? They're, they have lots of stimulus, there's a lot of breadth. I think it's a depth situation. Um, you don't really have to pursue anything that you're not interested in. You can just keep surfing towards the topics that you're interested in. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about teaching this new creature. This new species that obviously is human and will always respond to <laughs> liveness, but what might that be? Like we have so much more of a kind of a competition for attention. We're young, we're supposed to talk about it. Um, my iPhone was stolen and now I have a flip phone and I read novels again, so <laughs> tell your students to get rid of their iPhones. I don't know. Um, I, I, I currently work with um, undergrads and a lot of, uh, a lot of what they, what we do, um, a lot of them, most of them are like aerospace engineers and they're kind of taking this as kind of, um, kind of uh, a requirement, but what I find is, <laughs> and what I find is actually that they love it. They actually really love this, love it, like intro playwriting, and in, and I think partly it is because it's like this moment where they actually can uh, take a lot of this kind of 
a lot of the things that they're finding on the internet or like the, the things that they're interested in and kind of take this moment to kind of focus it. Um, and I think it's, it's also helping them in a way um, engage, engage with, uh, uh, with the other, with their, uh, their fellow students in a very different way. Um, I don't know, I, I think it's, yeah. Did any of you read the, there was an opinion piece in the New York Times about how uh, technology is making us unempathetic. I think that teaching theater right now is actually really important and I think that we have less competition, sort of. Liveness is a thing that isn't anywhere else and so people want to, I mean, rock shows, awesome. I love going to rock shows. Sporting events, awesome. I love going to sporting events, theater, that's about it. And so like, here we are talking to each other um, you go to plays, you're with people. I think that any, I mean, there's a lot of young people here who are amazing, who are apprentices here, who are doing this and are the next generation of theater maker. Like, I'm, I'm not as, as young as that. I feel, I feel a different generation also, but they're amazing and they're here and they wanna do this. I think that there's, there is a space and an excitement about theater, actually, that is, that is, didn't feel that way to me 10 years ago when I was that age. I felt like, oh, TV movies. But now, you don't even go to a movie theater with other people. Like, I watch all that media on my computer, like, by myself or with a friend. Um, but, theater, like, theater is alive. And look, look, we're all here in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> I think, yeah, just one last thing. I think it also is making audience, I, I think it's making audiences uh, more forgiving and interested in um, nonlinear structures. So that I think that there's this, there's something that's about to happen in the forms of storytelling that I, I'm really excited to see what that is. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to teach in a way that will allow that to happen is, feels like a really exciting challenge. So thank you for that question. Um, that's it, we're done. Thank you so much. <laughs>